Very good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's New Law webinar. Today's webinar, titled The Law Office Client Management, has been accredited for one hour of professionalism CPD credits in the provinces of Ontario, New Brunswick, and British Columbia. So I do repeat that today's webinar is accredited for one hour of CPD credits for professionalism CPD credits in the provinces of Ontario, New Brunswick, and British Columbia. So kindly do use the appropriate individual portals, the Law Society portals, search up this particular title, and get your one-hour credits. I kindly request you to use the phone numbers provided for a better quality experience. I have texted this in our Join Me messaging app. At any given time, please feel free to use the chat window to ask any questions that you may have regarding today's webinar. The webinar is being recorded and will be available to you on our YouTube channel as early as Monday next week. Now, like every other ULaw webinar, today's webinar has a specific agenda. What we're going to be covering in today's webinar includes the basic concepts of client intake, one of the most important primary and fundamental steps that a legal office undertakes when they not only introduce the services that you offer to a prospective client, but also starts to engage and retain a customer. Okay, so really the first initial steps of how you go about in taking the client's information, understanding how you as a legal firm can best serve the need of that specific client. In the process of doing that client intake, of course, there are certain compliance checklists and documents that the Law Society recommends that you as a firm not only generates but really captures so that you can generate those appropriate documents. Important pieces of information that the Law Society recommends that you capture during that process of a client intake. Okay, We'll briefly talk about the aspect of group management, how you can best classify, categorize, tag, group. There are many terms. Categorize or tag these different client information as well as the types of clients that you know your legal firm has to deal with. We'll then talk about how you best can handle conflict checks and non-engagements. Conflict checks, of course, as you probably know, is a way for you as a firm to ensure and have all the relevant information about if there's a conflict in representing a particular client. And there, of course, there are documents that you can use to outline, capture that information, and specifically talk about whether it is a conflict and the steps that you have taken to avoid the conflict, or if there are no conflicts, what were the next steps that you have taken? Have you accepted a retainer, or for whatever reason, have you transferred over that file to another colleague in the industry? Non-engagements are an interesting document, a must-have for certain types of clients, such as ghost clients, who actually provide you with a lot of information, but don't necessarily move forward retaining your service going forward. So in those cases, it's very important that you use a non-engagement as a vehicle to easily convey both for your own records as well as to your client about you not being any more obligated to represent the client's interest as they haven't signed up for a retainer. Okay. I do notice that a lot of our friends have joined us a bit late today for the webinar, just for the purposes of their interest. I repeat that today's ULaw webinar is accredited for one hour of professionalism CPD credits, and it's titled Law Office Client Management. And we've just gotten started with the agenda. So moving along from handling conflict checks and all engagements, which are all related to a client, we then move on to some of the Law Society's requirements after the client intake has been completed. 
So let's say you've done all the due diligence, you've captured all the relevant information, you've actually dealt with the conflict checks, you've dealt with the non-engagements for clients who are really not serious about retaining your service, and then we move on to the next phase of promoting that prospective client to an actual retained client. And this is where you create a matter for a specific client. And the matter would be relevant to the area of practice and the specific pain point that this client, of course, wants you to represent them and help them with, right? So once you do create that matter, there are certain documents, such as the client ID verification, authorization letters, retainer letters, very important, receipts for payments, including retainer receipts or just general payment receipts, are all important law society requirements and recommendations as part of the post-intake sessions of your clients. Interestingly enough, certain documents such as source of contacts, even documents such as credit card authorizations are many a times reviewed during an audit. Then we'll talk about how best you can analyze client information such as aging reports and fee books that pretty much tell you insights into the payment cycles and the outstanding payments and outstanding trust transfers that exist within each client and matter relationship. And finally, we'll talk about certain practice management techniques, best practices that you could use within your firm, especially as we near a festive season, how best you could promote and market your brand as you utilize key, I would say, channels such as email, even print, such as envelopes and contact cover letters that you can otherwise send to your clients as part of your correspondence. So let's look, take a look at them one at a time. Okay? So let's start with the client intake process. So truly, this particular webinar is a subset, if you will, of a, I would say, a longer presentation that we tra traditionally tend to deliver um, both for webinars as well as when we go teach at educational institutions, and that is the Everything Practice Management webinar that we deliver, which really talks about seven important steps or components of a legal firm's compliance checklist. And the client intake is really that first step within those professional obligations and requirements of that firm. And now we've expanded further, very specific to this client intake, and we've done that with several other subtopics and are continuing to present them as they are actually points of interest. Right. So one of the first most important professional obligations that you have as a legal firm is to ensure that you understand the key components of that initial introduction of your firm to a prospective client, the pieces of information that you capture during that initial correspondence. So one of the important things to keep in mind as you do that client intake, whether you do it through a practice management legal accounting software, whether you do it through a CRM system, whether you do it through a paper-based system, whether you use Excel sheets, Word documents, it does not matter. What's important is to have understanding of really the process involved and the data elements involved so that you can then improvise based on your situation and based on the tools that you have. One of the most important things to keep in mind as you navigate through this process is to ensure that you have a process within your firm, whether it's yourself or anyone else in the front desk to capture a detailed recording of all the calls and consultations that you make. When I talk about detailed recording, important pieces of information such as the first name, surname, middle name, last name, all of the very important official names by which they go by. Of course, there is an AKA name or also known as, but you may actually discover that further when you actually get into retaining them and creating the matter because those pieces of information are also relevant for certain types of practice. In fact, there are important data elements in certain court forms as well, 
such as the small claims. Additional pieces of information in the detailed recording can include the correspondence address, as and when it's necessary. In certain cases, you may not have a correspondence address. If and when available, a communication, either phone number or an email, or some way that you can actually reach to them. Certain legal firms do require a phone number because then they could use that as a channel to communicate with the client. Part of the initial capture of that information could also a bit of an understanding of how did that particular client get to know your firm for and why did they approach you. So that's what we call as the source of contact. And it's actually a law society requirement to capture that so that the auditor, when they ask you for that source of contact report, gets to understand the types of sources of marketing channels that are used by your firm to capture these leads and the sources through which you obtain clients. Okay? Now, once you've captured all this information, again, if you're using a CRM system, of course, that automatically gives you all the relevant reports. If you're using a legal accounting practice management system, it gives you the relevant reports. If you're using a manual system, please make sure you have the process of recording them in a way that's easily retrievable. Once you've captured this information, one of the most immediate next steps that the Law Society recommends is do a quick conflict check or a screening. Essentially what that really means is you take all that information and you pretty much scan or screen all of the client information, all the contacts that your firm has dealt with in the past to really appreciate and understand if there are any conflicts at all in representing this new client that has just knocked on your door. You know, have they been a representative in another matter? Have, have you met them, spoken to them? Do you have pieces of information that may be um, relevant in a multiple matter situation? And when you do this conflict screening, depending on the type of tool, once again, that you use, it may automatically retrieve and showcase to you the various different touch points of conflicts that may potentially arise, or the tool depending on the situation, may come back to you and say, there are no conflicts in representing this client. And if you're doing this a manual process, of course, you use your intelligence and going through all of your contact information to make sure there are no conflicts. Now, at that point, it's a decision point where you want to go ahead and move on to the next stage, which is really sign up a retainer agreement or move them forward towards signing up an engagement or a retainer letter. Or if there is actually a conflict in representing that and there's a clear conflict, then you have the opportunity to kindly let them know about the conflict. Now, either you can you know, sponsor them to another colleague who you believe who would you know, represent them because you believe there is no conflict for that particular legal professional to represent this client. Or you may just say, we apologize, but unfortunately we cannot represent you due to these potential conflicts. And when you do that, of course, you close, bring a logical closure, if you will, to that relationship with that prospective client with a non-engagement letter as well. It's saying, thank you very much. This is the conflict. Here's the non-engagement letter, which essentially says we're not responsible for dealing with your file as we did identify a potential conflict. Now, in that simple workflow of three steps, you have three to four important compliance documents or documents that are very meaningful to an audit that when you have are already available for you to share because that set of four documents tell a story. And that's all they're looking for in these audits, pieces of information and documents that tell the story. The story's got to be right. It's got to be regulated and compliant. And the story in that initial workflow was there was a client that you received on a Friday afternoon. Here's all the pieces of information. 
you may actually have received and scanned their driver's license to validate further that this is truly the first name, last name. You know, is it truly James Bond? Is it Roger Moore? Who is this person who just walked in? What's the proof to showcase that it's truly them? The next step, of course, is you've done a conflict screening. So a report that outlines the conflict screening with a date, and that's the most important thing. As on this particular date, here's the conflict screening report. And then the next step, which really is having found the conflict, you signing a non-engagement and you know, refunding a retainer, let's say if you actually did receive a retainer. But whatever the steps may be, that workflow, those set of documents tell the story. Now let's move on. Let's assume that there were no conflicts that you retrieved back from that conflict screening report. And you want to move forward with representing this client. It's fantastic. It's right in the ballpark of one of the most important areas of practice that your firm specializes in. And you move to the next step. And that's where the service and communication aspect of this client intake professional obligation kicks in. The service and communication outlines the important components to make sure that there's clarity in the service that you're willing to offer. The obligations both from your firm as well as the obligations that you as a firm expect from the client are clearly orchestrated or illustrated in a document, outlined in a document. Of course, unless this is a pro bono, even if this was a pro bono, it still needs to be documented. But let's assume there is, of course, a fee structure for your representation. That needs to be outlined clearly in a document as well. So combining these three major components as the next step, you either enter into an agreement, and that is either termed as an engagement agreement or as a retainer agreement, depending on whether there is trust money involved or not. So if there is a retainer that you expect as part of your policy and the money gets deposited into your trust account, then of course it's a retainer agreement that should clearly you know, outline what is the minimum retainer expected, how much is being expected to be topped up on either a periodic basis or based on a minimum amount that you need in the retainer. The retainer agreement, of course, talks about date, timelines, service level communications, SLAs, expectations from clients such as topping up retainers or making payments on time, agreements for how best you correspond with the client and how best you expect for the clients to respond back within eight SLA time or service level agreement time. For example, you could say, I would be using email as one of the primary channels of correspondence or communication. And to further add to that, you may say, you request the client to respond back, especially if you have a question that you've asked or let's say a piece of information that you want, that you expect the client to get back to you within, let's say, two to three business days or whatever that situation may be. It's clearly outlined, read through, agreed upon, and signed. And the last thing, of course, is the total collateral for fees. What is the price structure? What is your per hour rate? Or what is the fixed rate or flat rate? Or what is the you know, combination of these different types of fee structures that your firm may utilize to represent this client in this particular matter? All this becomes important integral aspects of that client management. Providing a retainer receipt is an important transaction and part becomes part of that client engagement because a retainer receipt is made up, of course, for a specific matter or a file, but the personality, the person involved who's actually paying for it is your client. And this could be an individual, this could be a corporate client, that really shouldn't matter, but it's the client nevertheless. So depositing the retainer in your trust account, providing an immediate retainer receipt so that both parties acknowledge that the payment has been made and received, 
is important. And then you move on to the next step, which is doing your due diligence work as part of executing the client matter. And this is, a, again, a quick, simple snapshot of everything that we've been talking the last five to seven minutes, keeping in mind that you outline some of these key aspects of the retainer agreement. One of the most fundamental starting points or contract, if you will, official contract between yourself and your client. So we spoke about the client responsibilities, of course, the nature and scope of the matter. If there are certain court dates that you anticipate, making sure that the scheduling of the course of representations are established and any expectations from your firm for your clients to be available are also outlaid. Okay. All right. So what are some of the most important compliance documents that we believe you would require as part of an audit? Client ID verification document is some, something that many times auditors ask for. It's how did you ensure that this is truly the person that walked into your door? So a scanned copy of a driver's license or a scanned copy of a passport or any legal document that has that information is a great example. But it's important as part of a legal firm's process for both yourself as a solo practitioner or if you say large firm for the front office staff to know, have the education, the training to know, to ask for that driver's license, can it, and make it as part of the file. Client intake form is a template provided by the Law Society across all provinces. And this intake form captures key data elements as part of that initial interview or conversation that you have with your client. This is the form that captures the address, the phone number, the ad, the name. It captures the source of contact, etc. Chronologically moving along, assuming that there are no conflicts, of course, there'll be the conflict checks. So you can see there's a conflict screening. And there's also a conflict check documentation. Conflict screening is internal to your company. You can use a tool, you could use a product or manually do it, but a conflict check document is a Law Society document template available that clearly gives you the opportunity to document what were the reasons that you had discovered and how did you do that and what is the final judgment. Is there a conflict? Is there no conflict? Etc. Right. So really documenting your stand with regards to that client is done within that conflict um, check confirmation document. Assuming you've done the conflict check, there are no conflicts, you move along, then the next chronological document is a retainer or an engagement letter, followed by a retainer or a payment receipt for that initial amount. Okay. Now, the source of contact is not specific to a client. The source of contact document is more specific to your firm, but across all of your clients. So for the month of October, if you were to generate a source of contact report, it should basically tell you that 30% came from family referral for about, you know, could, could have been about 25 to 30 or 50 clients that your firm has had that month. But it's really source of contact for all of your clients for a time period for the entire legal firm. And we spoke about the non-engagement letter. So if it so happens that either due to the conflict or if it's a ghost client situation where someone actually gives you all the information and then just disappears like a ghost, as the term sounds, that's really the terminology there. So either when there is a conflict and you non-engage the client or if the client for whatever reason there's hasn't come back to you after giving you a lot of their piece of information, that's an opportunity where you do a non engagement. And you need to find that non engagement letter as a template. You can either get it from tools that are available, such as Eula Practice of 
provides you that other legal accounting software, practice management softwares should provide you that as well. If not, of course, you reach out to your colleagues in the industry, Google it, there are many templates available that you can repurpose for all of these types of documents. And the law societies do provide templates as well to capture all these documents to make it part of that file. Now let's move on to the next phase where you've done the intake, you've created the matter, you've got the retainer, and you're continuing to execute the file. And when I talk about execution, I'm talking about going through the motion of the intake, visiting the court, traveling, dispersing, docketing, everything within the boundaries of the retainer engagement letter, right? And this is where, depending on each situation, the Law Society also has a recommendations for the types of correspondence and communication with your clients. If it's a very short-lived matter, if it's a quick matter like a POA, it's very time-bound, and it's going to be done faster. If this is, let's say, an example of a family matter or even a criminal matter or a corporate matter, this may actually go over a long duration. Sometimes these matters go over for over years, months. And when you come across such situations as where the law societies have certain recommendations, such as quarterly updates, it has yearly or annual updates that you can provide your client. And if it's a successful closure of a matter, then of course you close it with a closure statement or a statement of accounts. Like how a ghost client's logical closure is that with the non-engagement, a proper client who you've dealt with and you've completed and closed that matter their file logically ends with a statement of account or a settlement of accounts. But if it's an ongoing engagement, then you have the opportunity to communicate both on a quarterly basis as well as an annual basis with regards to where the file is. It could be information specific to the client's record keeping or bookkeeping, such as your bill of cost, it could be with regards to ledgers and journals or statement of accounts within that matter. It could be specific invoices, a list of invoices that have been generated. It can be specific to disbursements that were part of the invoices that were generated. So it really comes down to sometimes what the client may ask you for, because we sometimes deal with legal professionals that have corporate clients that have very specific reporting requirements on a periodic basis. Okay. But at the least, you want to ensure that you have it in your back of your mind to have quarterly and yearly updates. As part of that client management, we also talk about scheduled timelines and modes of channels of how you correspond with these clients. And the quick question is how often, how soon, how late can I reach to my client? Let's say they've signed their retainer letter, now what? Can I just be calling them every day? Do I have the time first and foremost to do that? If I even if I did, you know, does that warrant me to give them a call, correspond every day? And there's no right or wrong answer to that. The simple answer as we define it is it really comes down to the boundaries and the expectations that you have set as a firm prior to signing that retainer agreement or during that process and what has been documented as the proposed correspondence channel and the proposed timeline for correspondence or communication. But as a thumb rule, the Law Society does recommend, as I mentioned, at least having a quarterly review with your client, especially if that matter is currently active or open. But if it's a short-lived matter, how often you correspond for pieces of information to be gathered really comes down to what's been agreed upon in the retainer letter. 
And what are these opportunities within which you may have to reach out to your clients, either to ask for information or to send information regarding the file? Let's say you've signed the retainer agreement, the client walks out of the door, very happy that you are representing their case. As part of your firm's next steps, you would then endeavor into docketing, dispersing, of course, invoicing. So that almost becomes that first next logical document that you need to now communicate back to your client. Whether it's a retainer agreement and you're doing a trust transfer, or whether it's a general payment situation where you have to recover that payment, either ways, it's important that you send out clear, crisp invoices that communicate the piece of information fast and easy. So make sure that you send invoices or templatize invoices so that the pieces of information captured are precise easy to understand and consume by your client. And if the client has made a payment for a specific invoice, the next logical document that you send them right away is a receipt for that payment. Or in the case of trust transfers, you're not necessarily required to send this, but as part of a client management audit bookkeeping, in certain provinces, especially in the province of Ontario, when you do a trust transfer from a trust account into a general account, especially if you're doing it in the electronic format, then it's important that you file and fill out a document called Form 9A. Okay, so every action in that workflow or life cycle of managing a client pretty much has a compliance or a professional document involved as part of that process. When we talk about quarterly documents, of course, before quarterly, let's finish off that cycle. So you've got invoices, you've got payment receipts, and then once the matter is completed, you, of course, then have a closure letter in certain matters, based on the nature of the matter itself, you may actually have other corresponding opportunities, such as you know, court visit dates. You may actually text it to your client. You may use other means or modes of communication to ensure that the client is up to date and the tasks that they have to do. There may be phone conversations, either to ask for payment or a top of a retainer, a piece of information that you may need to gather. right? So all of that happens in between in the cycle as well. And common examples of quarterly updates, especially if it's an ongoing matter, include bill of costs. We spoke about this. The bill of costs pretty much covers all the piece of information within what's happened um, with that matter. Okay. All the total costs involved, what is the split up between dockets and the legal billing, legal fees, versus the disbursements. During the process of invoicing, were there any disputes or discounts provided as part of that invoicing? All of that is covered in the bill of cost. The statement of activity also covers a lot of the information, pretty much tells you an audit trail of every money touch point. Here's the retainer received, here's the first invoice, here's the trust transfer, et cetera, et cetera. Another important quarterly update could be that of a client fee book or an aging report, which is here are all the invoices that have been generated in these three months. Here are all the invoices that have been paid. Here are all the invoices that are outstanding and have not yet been paid. And we thank you and we appreciate if you can bring this to your attention and make those relevant payments. Fee book, of course, tells you all this information Aging report tells you another additional piece of information on top of that, and that is for how long has the client not paid you for that bill. One is to tell them that, hey, you owe me $1,000. The other aspect of the story is, dear client, you haven't paid me over 60 days that $1,000. So that's the big difference, and it's important that you, especially if you haven't recovered any unpaid invoices, it's great to send them an aging report. 
because we have a lot of legal firms that have um, interest implications if invoices aren't paid on time. And that's where the aging report helps. A yearly update, of course, includes the statement of accounts for the entire matter, both trust and general statements, both ledgers, journals that are involved. Trust balance summary, very important piece of information. The client may have paid you $5,000, but over the period of this year, how much of that money has been taken um, or has been utilized or used and how much is still left as trust balance in their account. Very important both for the client as well as for the law society because there are rules that govern how long you can hold on to these trust balances and documents that you have to generate for those as well. And last but not least, of course, as I mentioned, it's not all about business. It's all also about the customer service, the posture, and how you portray your client um, success and utilizing every opportunity possible to market the essence of your brand. So examples such as you know, Thanksgiving cards, season greeting cards, utilizing every possible touch point to bring in that little touch of personalization, a touch of class, if you will, that goes a long way. Brand recognition goes a long way because now that they've experienced this very professional service quality from your firm, knowing who your firm is, they would easily be able to now promote this across other colleagues or friends that need legal representation. Referral business is one of the top source of contacts for a lot of legal firms across Canada. Now that we've kind of established the key documents, the timelines in which these documents make sense, and a chronological structure of client management from client intake to closure of a matter. Let's look at some other components and aspects of contact or client management. Now, as a legal firm, of course, there are different types of people records or record of clients, otherwise other contacts that you may store. The one is, of course, you have client information that are then separated between you know, ghost clients and actual clients who have been retained. Now, within those, you could start to create certain groups and tags. And this is more from a practice management perspective for ease of retrieval of information as well as the ability for your legal firm to all be on the same page. So these are some best practices that we are recommending as someone who's been in this industry for a decade now. Tagging clients has uh, some importance to it as well. For example, is this a small claims client? It also helps you with your conflict checks too, because it's easier if you were to tag Roger Moore as a client, further easier if you were to tag Roger Moore a small claims court client in the province of Ontario or a, small, or a family law client in the province of British Columbia. Right? Makes retrieval of information faster. So, of course, you can tag or categorize these clients by the type of relationship or the type of area of practice. When we talk about types of relationship, you can tag a client saying, it's a, you know, it's a plaintiff situation. So I represented this client as a plaintiff in the small claim matter. Or you can tag a particular client as a tenant, saying, I actually dealt with Roger Moore. Yes, we know it's a landlord and tenant board matter, but was Roger Moore the tenant or was Roger Moore the landlord? Right? Because what this also gives your firm is the information about the areas of practice that you excel in. So you can have a better perspective of whether you're best at representing a landlord and tenant board matter, representing the landlord, or are you better off based on your past history, where have you been successful? Has it been better off representing the tenant? 
Okay, so this is not so much compliance. This is more for your own firm to have a better appreciation of the information that you have. Other types of examples of contacts that a legal firm comes across, of course, you have your own company's co-workers. There could be many individuals that touch a particular file or matter as you tend to collaborate within a firm. So capturing their information one time also allows you to repurpose that across files and matters. Every firm is also a business. One is the compliance when it comes to law society's guidelines. The other aspect is that you are a business in an individual province and you're bound by, uh, in fact, in Canada, you're regulated by CRA for all of the requirements of the revenue agency as you run a firm as a business that makes money, has expenses, and that's where you have vendors who you may actually pay on a regular basis as part of your bookkeeping or as part of the management of your firm. So vendors are an example of the type of contact that you can store one time and repurpose across your firm, whether you're cutting checks for a vendor or entering expense information for a vendor. The last but not the least, another example where categorizing contacts across clients and non-clients helps is in that of filling up of court forms. So when you look at, and again, we can speak, as you law, we can speak to specifically in the case of Ontario because we do generate court forms in the province of Ontario for certain silos of practice, like small claims, landlord and tenant, and that's where we find the document pretty much is asking for all of the contact information of the people, parties involved in a particular file or matter. So saving all this information, saving the information of the landlord who you're representing, as well as the multiple tenants that are involved in that matter, allows you to build the relationship within all of the additional parties involved. And that has two, I would say, two impact points. One is it most certainly helps you to generate that court form because, um, for example, we can automate that court form filling for you and reduce the time. But more than that, What's important is when you build that relationship, it makes it easier for a tool such as you or any practice management. When you build that relationship, the tool can then have a better appreciation for the conflict checks as well. So if it's a Roger Moore who is your client, who's the landlord, and you've got John Doe who is a tenant, and when you're representing, let's say, Robert Doe, the conflict screening should catch John Doe as a tenant in the Roger Moore matter that you dealt with, or it should capture any other piece of touch points that you've had the instance of the word Doe to see if there's a relationship between John and the other Doe we spoke about. A quick um, answer to one of the questions is how many CPD hours? Uh, this is accredited for one hour of professionalism CPD credits. As I mentioned, managing the source of referral, and we'll talk about that briefly, is every time you capture a new client intake, really understanding where did this client how did the client get to know you? Was it a Facebook advertisement? Was this a local newspaper ad? Was this uh, Yellow Pages? What was the source of marketing that drove this customer to your firm? It's very important in today's day and age because we're all trying to find the best way to market to our customers and finding best ways to retain these customers, trying to find the science around how we can repeat that, and hence capturing is almost the immediate first step before we can take next steps. 
We have spoken about this earlier on in our webinar, but truly it's an appreciation of how best you can handle these conflict checks. As I mentioned, there is a conflict screening, which is really the fundamental first step that scans your entire database, whether it's manual or automated, for an instance of a name or a combination of name, address, because sometimes it could have been the same corresponding address that was used by two parties. right? And then as an outcome of that conflict screening, you determine whether there is a conflict or not. And then there's a law society template called the conflict check report where you document the steps that you took to ensure that either there was a conflict and next steps you took or you document that there was no conflict because you did the conflict screening and you've checked your database and there's no instance of that individual. Okay. Also important piece of information is who performed that search when you talk about conflict screening. Was it yourself, the legal professional? Was this a frontline staff and an assistant, an admin? Who did that is also equally important. And, and last but not the least, um, I'm going to maybe spend five to ten minutes utilizing ULaw practice as an example after the slide share to kind of give you a quick walkthrough of the different documents, of course, and pieces of information. But prior to even doing that, one of the last aspects that I like to highlight upon is through the advent of technology, especially in the last two to three years, we tend to find that having just-in-time information about anything at all, it becomes very important for that ever so busy and multitasking entrepreneur. So as legal professionals, of course, there's the constant stress and strain of learning different ways that you represent your client, doing case studies and research work, etc. But of course, you have the burden of um, running a business and more importantly, a legal business that has two compliance components to it. One is with the law society, and the other is with the CRA, uh, assuming you're a Canadian business. Now, given all that parallel work going on, it's, imp it's almost imperative to have pieces of information in biteable sizes, in ways that are more mobile-friendly to consume, making it making you more efficient in consuming that data. You know, what's the point of generating you know, a three or five page report? It's more important to give you the top five pieces of information that may actually capture your attention. So that's where something like an analytics or a executive dashboard, whatever you may call it, becomes very important to give you the next, I would say really the next step in assessing your firm's data. So pieces of information like if you were to ask your firm this question, who are the top 10 or 5 to 10 clients that my firm has dealt with who have enjoyed a pro bono and what was the amount? So let's say that's the quick question. Having a quick dashboard to tell you that answer, I believe, is very powerful. It gives you the power of a large law firm who has the manpower to go get that answer. Right, so tools that you research have to have that level of sophistication as you move forward in this very competitive digital landscape. Another example, one is a pro bono, the other is how profitable is this particular client that I'm dealing with compared to how much of revenue have I gained? How much of expenses have I paid for? Especially could be disbursements. And if you've not recovered those disbursements, then it does become a liability for your firm because it almost becomes an expense to your firm. But appreciating those differences, the profitability, and especially if you provided a flat rate situation when you're billing $500 an hour, how proper, profitable was it for that particular client becomes important because you utilize that information to understand if it's even meaningful to get another referral from that particular client, right? Or if this was a very profitable client, of course, you send them a Christmas card. If it's not so much a profitable client, you don't send them the card. I'm just saying. 
but it's important to know the data that's in your database of your firm with regards to a client. Another great marketing, uh, because I'm mostly in um, customer success and really trying to understand the science behind how best we can serve clients and how we can grow the business, the source of contact becomes you know, initially not so much important because everyone's focused on starting the firm, paying the bills, getting that first 10, 20 clients. Everybody's just running with that specific mindset. But as you settle down and as you have this room and space to start to think about and strategize about your business, that's where the source of contact becomes so handy because that's really the starting point report that you can look at to get a better sense for where am I getting my clients from to begin with. Because that will also motivate where you spend the money to market it further. Okay. And of course, we are a big proponent of legal accounting and practice management softwares. Uh, these are tools and there's, of course, various opportunities, various tools out there in this growing marketplace. A great time to be a legal professional as the legal landscape of tools that allow you to more be more efficient, um, reduce your cost of ownership is increasing every day. The choices that you have are increasing every day, so it's important you make the right decision, the right choice. But it's important to keep in mind these four important aspects. One is ensuring that you can use this tool to be more efficient, because why do it otherwise, right? You could have just been doing this manually. What's the total cost of ownership for me to run this particular tool or a period of time? How compliant can this tool uh, bring me towards, uh, both from a law society, but also more importantly from a business ownership perspective? Because there's always two components. Often we end up paying a third party company to help you with that, but if you can do this all by yourself, then of course you're saving yourself money and time. And the last but not the least, the I would say the freedom to be able to accomplish and deliver all of this using the power of the internet, which is really being able to do all of this from anywhere that's connected, you know, of course everywhere uh, that's connected by internet. Okay, So you're not tied to a specific uh, system, to a specific desktop, that you have to be in that particular physical location to access a specific piece of information. Okay? So let me take, um, and again, of course, message from the sponsors, if you will, for lack of a better term. Uh, we are a new law practice, a Canadian company. We've been in business for close to 10 years, serving several hundred uh, clients legal professionals. Uh, we're both a legal accounting, practice management, and a business accounting software. Do check us out. We offer a new obligation 30-day trial, and uh, we will do our best to showcase our product and how best it can serve you. So if I may take the last five to six minutes, because you know a lot has been spoken, the essence truly is being aware of the pieces of information to capture while managing the life cycle of a client to take, really the life cycle of a client. The documents that you, on a periodic basis, are required to correspond and communicate with your client. Pieces of information that would be more useful to yourself and your firm with regarding that client, which allows you to be more smarter in corresponding with that client. So that's really the essence. So we spoke about being able to you know, add a client, be able to do all of that. So I'm going to just go j right jump in to show you how we go about doing that. I'm going to take a client information that I've already um, stored in the system. So here's Mr. Brian McDermott. So really the first step when that client walks in into your firm or gives you a phone call or somebody in your firm does this, you're basically capturing all of the piece, key piece of information. So this would be a client intake form with some basic information. Of course, you can add more information if you like, such as their nickname, just be Big Mac, right? 
birth name, marital status, birth date, etc., or just keep it at high level, first name, last name. Very important to capture the source of contact then and there, right? This is a family referral. This could be a Facebook ad, internet advertisement, whatever it may be. A law society referral, which is the case many times. Trade shows. And you can actually take further notes. You could say a law society conference. Okay, a correspondence address, a phone number, and as you know, what we do is we take that phone number. Just saying, uh, also gives you the opportunity to docket any phone conversations that you may have directly from the phone itself using our app. So, a phone number actually goes a long way to also improve efficient usage. So let's say you've done that initial client intake and you've done taken the Brian McDormand uh, piece of information. Really the next step is to, in our process, to do a conflict screening. So go ahead and basically you're going to say, I want to check every matter possible. And of course I've already created a matter for Brian McDormand for the, pur you know, for the purposes of today's demo and that's what's going to be generated as well. But that's the first step, is doing a quick conflict screening to make sure you're in very much of an appreciation for if there are any conflicts involved. For purposes of time today, let me just move ahead and let's assume that there are no conflicts. You go ahead and create a matter for Brian. As you can appreciate, Brian already has two matters created, and this was something that I had used in my previous webinar on disbursements demystified. So this is kind of the next chronological step. But if I were to look at all of those documents that you're required to capture to make sure that you've taken those steps, to tell the auditor that you've gone through the process and you have all this documentation. One, we've got all of that in a single panel, so you don't have to go searching for these documents, starting with the client ID verification. just to give you a sample for what these documents look like. The client ID verification is really a law society template that allows you to capture all the information. Of course, this is now pre-filled by ULaw. You don't have to type on this because a lot of this information has already been captured as part of that client intake process. So maybe you can just add more information that you maybe didn't know otherwise. Right? But what's important is who within your firm and what information did they capture to validate that conflict or, or the contact, client data verification. So specifically saying that you as a firm got the driver's license scanned and filed, very important. Maybe you got the passport, whatever the piece of information that there may be, okay? And who within the firm did this? So this could have been Roger Moore, this could have been Roger Moore's assistant. And here's the conflict screening report. You can see there are a few, so what ULA does is it not only checks for the exact name, but it also looks at sounds like and you can see there's a Brian versus Bill eviction of tenant, and that's exactly the matter that we were looking at right here. So it's pretty much captured that. There's also telling you instances of names that sound similar, like Brian. So it's smart enough to tell you all of that. And what's more important is that the conflict screening document dates this document. So when you do a conflict check report, which is then really the next compliance we'll do, we first did the client identity verification, so that's done. The next is the client intake form. So this is again a law society template that pretty much tells you how you can best capture all the information about that client. So how did you hear about us? So you already captured at a trade show. So I've got that. We've got Brian McDermott's first name, last name the address, the phone number, 
And now you can, of course, add to this. What is the issue that you want legal representation for? So you can say small claims. No. So if there is already one, then you could have added a court file number. Any other types of parties involved? At this particular time when you do this document, and if you've not entered this information, it's not there, but there's other ways of adding that. So moving along, conflict screening report. So this is the Law Society's report and the document that they expect you to fill out for every client to make sure that you are not only aware, but you also make the auditor aware that you are aware. <laughs> I apologize for that wordplay, but really that's what it is. So it's really asking you, okay, you've got all this information, now tell me what is this client's information about. You could say conflict screening done through no conflicts. And you can attach the conflict screening report that we have generated. If I can only find that, there it is. So you attach this document as a proof or as a supplement to this document. But this is the document where you're telling the Law Society also if there was a conflict, the steps taken. Okay? And then telling them that whether there's a conflict, maybe a possible conflict. And if you are still representing the client, what steps did you take? So did you refer them to another person? Did you decline a retainer? And of course, you signed this. So we've done the client data verification, the client intake form, conflict screening document. Then we move on to the next step, which is really engaging the client. You've got retainer letters, engagement letters, exam. Quarterly statements, statement of activity, clearly tells you from the starting of that matter till today, everything that has touched upon this matter. Okay. So that's about how you go about creating each of those compliance documents that are required starting with the client data verification, going up to the non-engagement and closing letters, essentially to build the workflow and the chronological steps and the documents involved as you manage a client through that life cycle. I've been told in the past that sometimes going past a certain time beyond 3 o'clock uh, can be a bit, uh, bit of a problem for clients, so I'm, I'm really going to wrap up this webinar today um, unless you have any specific questions. But the bigger picture here is having to use the right tools at the right time to deliver the right set of documents that are required for a fast-paced legal industry, for a fast-growing entrepreneurial setup, and knowing the specific law society and CRA requirements that govern you, um, very important. And today's webinar specifically, hopefully, focused and gave you information about the client intake service communication and how you best manage client information within a firm. Please feel free to email us at any given time at support at ulawpractice.com with either feedback with specific to today's webinar feedback on other topics you would like for us to cover in the coming weeks. And if this is regarding the company or the product, feel free to reach out to us for that as well. So with that, I will open the floor for any questions that the audience may be having with regards to today's webinar. Okay, so we've got a first question around the analytics. That's a good point. So at ULA, we have analytics both on our web 
presence, which is what I'm showing you today. But we also have it on our mobile phone, so you can download our app, and it's available there as well. Yeah, so we actually do have a credit card authorization form. Uh, the question is, do we have a credit card authorization form? Uh, yes, we do. So it's under document generation. And we can make sure we get that to you. So the analytics that I mentioned earlier are about key insights that can be specific to a client, can be specific to a matter, can be specific to the business itself. But keeping today's context in mind, if I were to say, where am I getting my revenue? Which specific clients am I getting the revenue for this month of October? You can quickly drive that piece of information. You can say, here are the top seven individuals and the value of their revenue compared to the percentage of their revenue put together for this particular month. Kind of gives you a bar graph, if you will. Right, you can of course, expand on it. You can really look at it and you can say, all right, Mr. Brian, great job. I really have to do a good job of giving him the highest level of experience. But then that could be a different story. So you could also check, you know, where is my, what's, you know, expense chart by client? What are my disbursements looking like? Or what are my expenses related to delivering my services for that client? So you can see there's about $130 and this could have been disbursement. So that's when you do a deeper dive into the business itself. You can look at pro bono chart by client, and you can do this, let's say, for the entire year. For this entire year, who are the top five clients? So again, this is the type of data and analytics that you can drive out of the data that's been saved. Hope that explained that question. So you can see that James Henry has had almost an hour and a half. Mr. Nerdy has had almost seven and a half hours. And of course, thankfully, this is a demo data. So you've got Mr. Harvey taking almost a day of pro bono. That's just too much. Any other questions? Okay, I'll hopefully take this as the last question, which is, how do I know the outstanding payments by client? Good question. Uh, there's multiple ways in which you can approach answering that question. You could have pretty much a, you can do it as a business, pretty much getting that for the entire business. We spoke about your aging report. So you can basically, that's really, from what I understand, aiding for the entire business, or you can do it specifically for a particular client. Okay, so you can search it up for a particular client if you like. Um, so the aging report will tell you over a date range for how long someone's not paid you. Okay. Uh, you could also use uh, other documents. Um, I'll give you an example. So here's a great example of the invoice balance report that tells you by client who's owed you in what format. So this is also client information. But as I mentioned, if you've been holding on to trust money for a very long time, then that's frowned upon as well. Because the law society said, that, well, if you've had that trust balance for six years or if you've had an outstanding deposit for a very long time, outstanding withdrawals pending for a long time, those are the types of little tricky situations that they want you to avoid. So, if, For example, John Bell, for over three years, three and a half years more, there's uh, this money owing. You know, what, what have you done about it, right? More importantly, the pending trust transfer is a very 
integral part because that's money to be made. That's your money sitting just in a trust account that you've not moved into your general account. So when you look at a document such as this where it says, you know, let's look at the last most recent transaction here. If I look, Mr. Fake Johnson, you know, he owes you about $123. But if you look at Johnny Walker, there's about $100 left in trust money for him to be moved over. Maybe he paid a retainer of 100 So you can quickly go to your matter. And this is where information about a client and managing that client information helps you make informed decisions. So you can use that information now that you have it. Look at that. Q H N N Y. There it is. You can choose that particular matter. And in real life, you may have done this. Sometimes what happens is that you may have not done this in real life, and then this helps. But in some cases, you may have actually done it in real life. You've just not told the system that you have which is equally important because if the system doesn't know it, then it's not going to give you the right data or the report or the reconciliation many times would become a problem. So by just clicking the transfer button, you move that eligible $100, keeping you compliant, of course. And you can tell us how you paid for it. And this is where we spoke about the electronic fund transfer, uh, specifically in the province of Ontario where that information is pre-populated as well. And when you regenerate that report, you would not find that line item. So that's how you would use this, but it also tells you who just simply owes you money. So this Mr. Jack Norman, that's the money owing and that's the payment he owes because that's the column. The column really is client owes. Okay? So hopefully that answered that question. Any more questions, please? Ah, the aging report. Okay, sorry. The title for today's webinar is Law Office Client Management. So this webinar is being recorded and will be available for you to review or consume one more time on our YouTube channel as early as Monday. We would love for you to subscribe to our channel, like our channel so that you can get more such timely updates with every CP that we generate. I guess I'll wrap this up with this final answer about aging and what that really means. So if you really look at this piece of information, it tells you John Bell um, owes you $3,954, right? Or it tells you some guy who's the last, you know, fake Johnson owes you $123.72. So maybe you just generated that invoice day before yesterday. And if you have, let's say, a time period or a term for payment as 30 days, of course, it's you know, it's not really right to ask him for that information or piece of payment right away because he does have 30 days. Uh, yep, today's CPD is for one hour of professionalism CPD credits. So what the aging report does is kind of adds just an extra column, let's say to the same report, that tells you for how long has Mr. Fake Johnson not owed you by 123.72. So you can either draw that report for all your clients or you can go to a specific client and look at the report from that perspective. So if you know that there's this one client who always defaults, right? You kind of know that situation, but you have to deal with them anyways. You can go to that specific client information and we find that quite often in firms where they actually task this to their front desk admin 
to be able to go in here and generate a report which says, okay, you know, what's the aging on this individual client? And then you know So he falls within the bucket of zero to thirty days. So he Mr. Peg Johnson owes us then the days outstanding is five, right? Because that's when the invoice was generated. And that's very important piece of information. So if there aren't any more questions, I once again thank everyone who joined me today for today's webinar. I sincerely hope it was an informational session, your time well spent, and of course look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. Thank you once again, and uh, happy Friday.